Hi, everyone. I am Nathan Stoll, the chair of VLAB. VLAB is a all-volunteer 5013C nonprofit that for 30 years has connected innovators, investors, uh, experts, and curious minds to explore disruptions that are near their inflection point and discover insights from founders before their household names. Um, our topic tonight focuses on eliminating passwords and the technologies to do that. And I wanna say that both from my wife's commentary this evening, as well as having watched many consumers fumble in countless user research videos over my career, I think many of us could not be more excited about the future of these technologies that will be discussed tonight. In a moment, I'll introduce our moderator to explain more and introduce our panelists. But first, um, a few words of thanks. Uh, as I said already, uh, this is an entirely volunteer organization and nonprofit, and many of you made donations tonight for the event. Thank you for providing the support we need to run the organization. To all our volunteers, without you, there are no events. A special thanks to our program co-chair, Shai Land, our marketing chair, Bob Galina, my vice chair, David Hamm, um, and uh, all the rest of our executive team and our volunteer event team. So proud of the work you did to bring the panel tonight and a huge thanks to Win Pai Lu, the chair of this event team, as well as Danielle Stryker, Sandeep Verma, Sunil Sethi, Marion Sharp, and I already uh, covered the others. So with that, I'm excited to be able to introduce our moderator, Andrew Shakyar, the Executive Director and CMO of the FIDO Alliance. The FIDO Alliance focuses on providing open and free authentication standards to help reduce the world's reliance on passwords. So without further ado, Andrew, please take it away. Super. Thank you, Nathan, and, and thanks to the whole VLAB team for having me and, and for hosting this you know, very important uh, discussion uh, tonight. Um, I've been personally involved with Fido Alliance since the start of 2016, um, and have certainly seen a lot of progress since then. Um, and I actually first got involved in the identity space in 2001 uh, when I went back to work for Sun Microsystems to help launch an initiative called the Liberty Alliance. Um, this is a set of standards for federated identity. And then I also drove Sun's identity management products and services. So that was a good 20 years ago now. And um, you know, much of what I did back then was work with Sun's global sales teams to talk to our top customers about the concept of identity, which was a new thing in, 20, in, in 2001. And we talked about what identity meant for their businesses, for their customers, for their employees, um, and you know, trying to take a very abstract concept and, and make it real and, 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 and pressing. Um, and of course, the identity space has really you know, grown a lot since, since then. Um, but identity is inherently tied to you know, being able to authenticate or verify the person on the other end of the wire. And that's still a problem that is vexing us uh, you know, some 20 years later. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, and, and these, you know, here's some statistics that, that, that point that out. Um, and I could probably spend, you know, the entire, you know, 90 minutes with slide after slide of statistics that point out, you know, the challenges um, that, that passwords present. Uh, I think, you know, as Nathan introduced, we, we can all relate to the fact they're hard to use. Um, but the, the, you know, these data like this helps quantify the problem. Um, it, you know, they're the leading cause of data breaches. Uh, they cost businesses, you know, billions of dollars per year. They hinder commerce. Um, and you know, simply put, I don't think they're fit for purpose uh, for today's networked economy. So, you know, we know the password model is broken. Um, you know, they're, they're, as, as a user, we can all relate to the fact that we say they're clumsy or they're hard to remember. And that is true, right? So if you're doing passwords correctly, um, you know, you have a very complex password with you know, multiple types of characters, unique passwords for each site. Um, but even then, you know, they're hard to use, right? Imagine trying to enter a, a complex password into a smartphone or heaven forbid, a smart TV. Um, so the usability is, is very impractical um, as is the ability to actually remember them and use them effectively. But I think the biggest threat of passwords is that they're easy to fish, easy to harvest and easy to, to use for replay attacks, right? So anything on a server can and will be stolen, right? And so SMS, and OTPs add security. So any 2FA, any second factor authentication is better than a password alone. Um, but SMS is not an answer um, to the password problem, right? Because SMS OTPs can still be fished. 
So they also sit in a server. It's still a server-side shared secret. Granted, it's there for a much you know, shorter period of time, but through, it's through a very simple you know, replay attack, uh, a, a phisher can also grab your SMS um, uh, passcode and successfully fish you and take over your account. So you know, what FIDO found when FIDO was founded in 2013 is that there is an imperative for simpler and stronger authentication. Right? So greater usability and security than passwords alone, um, greater security and usability than the SMS is the second factor, and usability is really important as well. Because a lot of data shows that you know, the more complex the second factor is, the lower the opt-in rate is, especially over a prolonged period of time, and especially for consumers who tend to be more fickle and don't have to you know, use a certain technology like you can mandate in an enterprise. So that's where FIDO fits in. You know, what FIDO Alliance is doing is we're creating open standards for simpler, stronger authentication using public key cryptography. You know, fundamentally, again, we're shifting the market from being dependent on authenticating users on a server to allowing people to use public key cryptography that allows them to authenticate locally with devices that they likely have in their hand every day. So you can either use what's on your PC or your handset, or you can use a device like a security key. Uh, these are all very simple to use. Um, single gesture activities to allow you to authenticate yourself from your device. Since everything's done locally on the device, it's impossible actually to be fished, right? Someone could maybe, the only way to take over my account is for someone to physically be here, grab my device, you know, touch my key or touch my, you know, biometric, which is not, you know, prevents uh, attacks at scale and, you know, protects these, these massive, prevents these massive breaches. Additionally, um, you know, as we look at the broader landscape, you know, beyond just the FIDO specs, this, this is part of the problem that we have here, right? There's a, there's a credential theft cycle. So, you know, I talked before about the, the, the core problem is this dependence on server-side credentials. You know, part of the problem with that is that they can be spoofed. So even a complex password, if stolen, can be, you know, stuffed in another account. And credential stuffing is quietly but massively a huge problem. In fact, just a couple of days ago, uh, there was a, a massive dump of, I think, 3.2 billion credentials, which is a combination of a number of, of uh, credential spills that what made themselves available on the, the dark web. These are pairs of usernames and passwords and email addresses um, that a you know, hacker uh, can quite easily buy for you know, a matter of pennies and then programmatically try to stuff on every you know, high value or mid value site on the internet. And you know, as you look on this slide here, you'll see some interesting data points here. You know, for the e-commerce space, you know, up to 90% of login attempts are stuffed attempts. All right, so fake, they're, they're spoofing attempts. So think about the actual costs associated with trying to protect against that. What's even worse is that up to 2% of these are successful. All right, so a, a 2% success rate on 90% of logins is actually quite high, which is why you see an annual cost to U.S. businesses of over $5 billion. You know, and, and simply put, the only way to stop this problem, the only way to break this cycle, is to break the dependence that we all have on server-side credentialing, server-side authentication, which is you know, where we all want to head towards. So let's look at, you know, that's kind of the landscape that we sit in. It's also the same landscape we sat in around a year ago today, right? So if you go back to February 2020, which feels like eight years ago, of course, um, digital transformation was, was you know, the, the buzzword du jour. Um, and, you know, roughly speaking, you know, digital transformation means to, you know, put all your core business processes online and you know, fully digitize things. Um, in fact, I co-authored a paper at the World Economic Forum on the importance of authentication for digital transformation. But even then, you know, I think I, like most people, kind of thought of digital transformation in this kind of slightly hand-wavy, vague, you know, five-year plan. Like, well, you know, we'll map it out over five years, five years, and that's your time frame for doing digital transformation. Of course, then, you know, COVID hit. And all of a sudden, you know, five years were compressed into five months. And that's changed everything, right? And we saw some of the data before. Um, in, in the initial slide that, you know, we see, um, you know, phishing, you know, growing like crazy right when COVID hit, all right? So, you know, Google um, has cited over 18 million phishing emails that are, you know, have COVID-related um, themes to them, over 18 million per day. Uh, this is why so many companies now have accelerated their digital transformation plans, because all of a sudden their workforce is a very high-value, soft target distributed at home. Um, and their customers, you know, some of whom were used to coming and doing you know, in-branch or in-store um, commerce, all of a sudden need to you know, have these you know, digital assets available to them as well, and they're a good target for hackers. So say what you want about hackers, um, but they're certainly smart, they're certainly industrious, and, and they certainly know how to you know, chase down 
opportunities where they see them. And COVID has certainly been one. So this is, you know, the imperative we all face in addition to the general need to re you know, reduce reliance on passwords as we had before in the pandemic that's really accelerated this imperative and it's, it's grown significantly over the past year. So we'll be talking more about that today, just a little bit about FIDO Alliance. Um, FIDO Alliance, as, as Nathan said, we are an industry standards body um, focused on creating open uh, standards for better, stronger user authentication. Uh, this set of logos you see here on the screen, this is our board of directors. We have around 42 board companies. Um, what I like about the set of companies is that really, if you ask yourself the question, you know, what type of companies need to be sitting around the table together to solve the password problem, you'd come up with a list that looks a lot like this. Uh, you have the companies that are shipping platforms and devices at massive scale. You have experts in biometrics and security. And last but not least, um, you have service providers whose businesses are dependent on their ability to securely deliver high assurance services to billions of users worldwide on a daily basis. So that's who's working together. That's who's collaborating inside of FIDO Alliance um, to help bring the industry and the whole marketplace as a whole um, forward and, and to provide better user authentication. So with that, um, thank you again for having me. I'm excited for today's discussion. I'd now like to introduce Ori Eisen, uh, the founder and CEO of TrueSona. Ori. Thank you, Andrew, for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, I'll wait for the slides to come up. I would love to share with you a little bit about the journey, why Strusona started, uh, a little bit about our story and our vision. And then we'll end up with a couple of demos just to show how far this technology have come. Because I'm sure many of you are also thinking how mature these things are. Can we really make the jump? Of course, when you see uh, people like us in Silicon Valley sitting and talking about it, we think that the future is already here, it's just not well distributed. But the good news is that uh, some uh, companies already have taken the path and we'd love to show you uh, that you can too. Everybody who's listening to this conversation tonight is an agent of change, whether you're an employee at a company or just a consumer or an IT leader, you can too make a decision that part of the digital transformation, like Andrew said, will be to get rid of passwords. Uh, a little bit myself and the journey, uh, I started, this is my fourth startup and I started it in 2015 after uh, doing a lot of time with fraud and fraud prevention all the way from being an executive at a large credit card company and working for uh, the largest domain name registrar. I've seen fraud over the last 20 years uh, evolve because it's changing and at the same time, it's still the same. Uh, if you've seen ever the cartoon in The New Yorker with the two dogs where one tells on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. Uh, we just celebrated 20 years of that cartoon last July. Uh, and I don't think that we have solved the problem on a mass scale yet. So when I was thinking, what should I do next? I think getting rid of passwords and solving this digital identity is probably one of the best thing we can do as uh, leaders in you know, Silicon Valley and in technology for a very simple reason. And you'll see it in my slide soon. If we are making it easy on the bad guys to just waltz into people's accounts. And when you look at it that way, that is my origin story. Uh, when I realize that when I do my job well, I'm actually preventing bad things from happening in the world. All of a sudden, it's not about just the MRR and the PNL. It's also about a mission and to do something that actually benefits society. I'm going to show you just a couple of slides and then uh, a couple of demos and move over. Andrew shared with you uh, many um, statistics. I want to focus just on one here, which is about saving passwords in browsers. And let's include password managers or password vaults there because I do see many people uh, confuse saving passwords in a vault with solving the password problem. And I hope after the next slide, you will walk out of this room thinking, yeah, it might help some, but it's not solving the issue. Let me show you why. Because we have so many passwords, we are now using a crutch. So instead of a little post-it note where we remove words, we now do it digitally. And yes, it's easier than remembering 40 or 80 different passwords. But at the moment that you load the password into your form, and I'm showing here a simple WordPress login, 
that username and password credential is passed on the wire. And if you have anything listening to your session or any keystroke um, malware, you've just provided those credentials. So yes, you might not need to remember them because your vault does, but with the attacks we see today, the vault is not solving the issue. We need to get static credentials off the wire, and then we have a shot of fortifying our accounts. If we get rid of static credentials, and uh, whether we do it with a FIDO compliant service or how Yubico does it or how Trisona does it, there's a few manifestations of how to go about it. The, the key to remember is keyloggers will no longer work if we get rid of static passwords because they could be there. We can't put them back into the jar, right? But they will not be effective. SIM swapping attacks will not be effective because even if your phone number is ported to somebody else's phone, because we're not using SMS and OTP, it will not matter. And credential replay, which I think is the attack vector we should all be worried about because we have pushed the bad guys over time to that corner. And now they have no chance other than to steal credentials there. So the collection of all these things have to get off the internet if we want to leave a network better for the next generation. In the last few minutes, I'm gonna show you two quick demos of how far we have come. And if you ask yourself how far we've come and what do you mean a few demos, let me show you. Thank you guys for giving me the control. I'm now gonna share my desktop so you can see both my screen on the left and my phone on the right. And I'll just ask Andrew to confirm that you guys can see that. Yep. Fantastic. So I'll start on the Trisona website on the left with something that anybody can do when we're done with the session. I'm going to click here on the Try Now area and in the first option, just to show you if you download an app, first I'll show you the app-based solution and then the not, but it's as easy as this. You can simply click on a button and CISOs today can choose either to show this QR code or only to show it on machines that have registered. That is an option. And on the right, I'm simply open our app, which is free in the app store. And as you can see, my hand is moving through. And the user experience is this. I simply point. That's it. The screen on the left realizes it was uh, scanned. I then get a push only to this phone. We're not using the SS7. I click on the accept button and then unlock it with either face ID or touch ID and we're done. Now, I know this was a bit fast, so that's why our button is called let's do it again. So I'll do it one more time just so you can see how easy it is to do. You simply click, you scan, you get the push and you're in. It is that simple that I hope you'd agree it passes the parents test that they can also do this too. Now, the most important thing in this technology, and we can talk about it later on in the break rooms, is how does it fight anti-replay? How does it fight key loggers and so forth? Because otherwise we have not solved the real problem if we don't care for these things. And in this specific uh, solution, we absolutely do. So one last time, again, it's as easy as that. You simply click scan, you open the scanner. Here's my hand coming through. I'm simply pointing. I'm getting the identity resolved to my phone and I'm in. It is that simple. I was also asked to talk about what comes next. And I do think many organizations do not want to only authenticate people who have their brand's app. So if you think about a bank or a healthcare company and also employees who come to work do not feel comfortable sometimes downloading an authenticator app on their private phone because they feel that the employer might spy on them or get information they didn't really want to give. For that reason, I'm going to show you something that tomorrow will be announced. And as the audience here at VLAB, you get to see it before anybody else, but in about 24 hours, it will be on the wire. We have taken the FIDO protocol, which we're now certified for. And in addition to all it does, and Stina, I'm sure we'll talk to you about how Ubico uses FIDO, We've now added another layer here that allows us to also invoke FIDO over HTTPS. And it would look something similar to this. I'm just gonna click login and note that I'm gonna take my app down because there's no need for it and just open a camera. So this is just my regular phone camera. Here's my hand coming through. 
And I want you to see that if I scan this with the camera, I get this a hint that there's a URL in there. And that's how we match that to the FIDO server. So it will only work for that domain. And by using uh, bi-directional secure sockets, you see how the screen on the left got the message that someone scanned it. And now I'm going to use WebAuthn with the FIDO protocol, which in here I added my identity with a driver license to say Ori Eisen. I can now simply use my phone as the FIDO authentication to complete it, even though I've invoked it uh, over HTTPS. I'm going to do this one again one more time because I know it's very quick. So I'm going to click login. I'm simply going to open my camera. There's no need for an app. And I do believe this will give us more flexibility for FIDO use cases. And as you can see, once I open it in the browser, the two sockets connect on the back end, and I can invoke WebAuthn with the FIDO protocol to complete the challenge response. Later on, if you come to the breakout room, we can show more demos and talk about what's underneath of it. I'm sure curious minds want to know. And I'll go and ask for one last slide because I have eight minutes and I'm on minute six uh, to tell you why I wake up every day. Uh, I had the pleasure of doing four startups in my life, some with great exits. And many people ask, why do you still go to work? Uh, other than saying I'm addicted to being an entrepreneur, this is my mission. I simply realize where the money goes when we don't do a good job in authentication. It funds very, very bad things. Go look it up. So every day we keep using passwords and are turning a blind eye to the nefarious uses as a result of it. We're actually helping bad guys. So we're on a mission to curb the funding of evil through this technology. And I hope you will get recruited as a result to make your special change in your world to move us to a world without passwords. Thank you for having me, guys. Okay, Ori, thank you for that. And thanks for sharing that demo. Um, super compelling, of course. Um, and now we wanna turn things over to the rest of the panelists. I wanna introduce the audience to our remaining panelists and then open things up for a discussion amongst the, the five of us. And ultimately we'll be taking questions as well. Um, so Stina, can you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Andrew. Yes, uh, I am the CEO and co-founder of Ubico. Uh, we started as long back as in 2007. Um, at the time, um, I was working as an industrial product designer. That's my background. And my online bank had told me to register uh, to the bank with a username and password and a software certificate that I should download on my computer. But um, a white hat hacker and a security expert told me that it would take him one day to write the code that would empty my bank account. So to inform the bank about this risk, I called them up and I got the response, please tell your friend not to do that. <laughs> and uh, that actually, that white hat hacker and security expert was my husband and the father of my three children. He uh, knew at the time that any software downloaded on a phone or computer or any username and password was easy to fish and hack. He knew how to do it. He is not a criminal, but he had the expertise. He also uh, told me that the more uh, secure solutions that he didn't know how to hack, like smart cards, actually were too complicated to use. You know, a smart card needs a reader, a client software, a driver. Um, they are only designed for to work with one or a very limited number of services. And they were not designed for mobile and they were not designed for the modern web. Um, so Jacob and I, this brilliant electronic computer engineer, uh, we came up with a little UB key, a little USB key. Uh, and the first version of this key could only work with one service. Um, we call the YubiKey, we call it YubiKey version of enabling one simple and secure key to any number of services. And we could not realize that vision alone. So two years later, after we found the company, Google started buying our product and we knew it was time for us to move from Sweden to Silicon Valley. And we started the journey that Andrew actually has, um, 
you know, told you about. Uh, we uh, created the first FIDO protocol, the FIDO U2F protocol. Um, um, we contributed some of our inventions and, and worked together with Google to, to offer the first security key in the market. And Jacob came up with the concept of enabling one single authenticator to any number of services. And that's actually a game-changing protocol for FIDO because it enables you now to have a hardware key that works across all internet, to your bank, to your social media, to your company, to whatever, and uh, only with a simple touch. But in order to make this really work everywhere, we had to get all the platforms and browsers on board, all the mobile devices, all the computers, and that took about 10 years. So here we are, 10 years later, um, and I would I want to mention before I hand off to my other panelists, uh, three events that I think is super important. One was a report that came out two years ago where Google uh, actually said that it was not only stopped phishing versus SMS and other things, it was actually easier and faster and significantly less support demanding than other uh, um, authentication solutions on the market. And I think that is the critical thing. If it's not easy and if it's not low cost thing, people will not, you know, not going to use it. The other thing that I think was super important is uh, that not only all leading platforms and browsers are behind this now, but uh, end of last year, we got the evidence that security keys, including YubiKeys, helped to protect democracy. It helped to stop major phishing attacks from non-democratic countries in the US election. And that was probably the proudest moment in my life. Thank you so much. Handing off to next. Okay, thank you, Stina. Um, our next panelist is Candace Worley from Ping Identity. Candace, do you wanna introduce yourself, please? Great, thank you, Andrew. Candace Worley, I'm the Chief Product Officer for Ping Identity. I've uh, been with them just a little under a year at this point. Uh, prior to that, did a short stint with Amazon Web Services and then uh, nearly 20 years in the security industry with McAfee. Um, it's been very interesting going from kind of what I would call the security, pure security, traditional security to the identity space. And what's been most interesting is I can't help but look at identity through the lens of security. I'm um, having spent so long you know, in that world and coming here now, I kind of look at identity as the pointy end of the security sphere. If you don't get your identity right, you better pray that you got the rest of your security practice right. Because identity is basically the front door to the house. And uh, if you got it wrong, you let them in. So it's been really interesting for me to kind of um, learn the identity space, learn the products um, and how it fits into things like, you know, zero trust and the overall security infrastructure for our customers. Okay, super. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Shim Chan of, uh, from Greylock. Shim. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, you know, pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, I'm Ashim Channa. I'm a partner at Greylock. Uh, you know, very old venture firm, got started in 1965. Uh, today, we are, uh, you know, investing out of Fund 16. It's a billion dollar fund. We do enterprise and consumer software, you know, across stages. Uh, I've been at Greylock since 2003. So, you know, we're 17 years now. And I spent about half my time on cybersecurity and half my time in other areas. Uh, prior to coming to Greylock, I was at Checkpoint Software from uh, you know, 10 million in sales to about half a billion in sales as the VP of product management. And I see an old friend from Checkpoint in the text, uh, in, in the chat. So I see Australia, I can't see you, but uh, thanks for your chat message there. Um, at Greylock, you know, we continue to be really active in cyber. Uh, you know, we uh, led the Series A at Palo Alto Networks. I'm still on the board there 15 years later. We also led the Series A at Okta, you know, which has uh, turned out to be a very important company, uh, you know, in particular around, uh, you know, SaaS uh, security today. Um, uh, you know, we continue to be active in cyber. Today, we're in five cyber companies at Greylock, you know, in SaaS security, email security, developer security, SaaS tax surface management. Uh, you know, it's kind of fascinating, similar to some of the other panelists here have been around security now, you know, for uh, I'd say a number of years, in my case, you know, over two decades, it's been kind of fascinating to watch this industry evolve. Uh, I would say, you know, it's never been more important than it is today. And uh, it's actually ironic, you know, if you look at the amount of money spent on product and services today, uh, there are varying numbers, you know, on that. 
But I think most people would say, you know, there's over 100 billion spent every year on product and services broadly around cyber. Yet if you ask most folks today, do you feel more secure? I think very few hands would go up. And, you know, that's true both on the enterprise side and on the consumer side. Um, you know, it's also worth noting, right, that, uh, you know, hackers don't break in, they log in, right? And so this actually, you know, points back to kind of, uh, you know, really the importance of this panel, right, where basically what ends up happening is credentials get compromised or stolen, right, and accounts get taken over, right? And so, um, you know, just another, just a couple other comments I could make is also, you know, I'd say with work from home, this has actually become much more complex, you know, both on the consumer side as well as on the enterprise side, right? And, you know, the perimeter really has changed, right? I would, you know, I like to think it's the perimeter has gone out, you know, and it's gone out, you know, with work from home, from, you know, the offices to, uh, you know, to endpoints, you know, in all of our homes, you know, on our home computing devices, our home networks now suddenly have become a part of, you know, the equation. And the perimeter has also gone up. Right, it's kind of gone up into the cloud, up into SaaS, and so these have become new compromise points, uh, you know, for organizations. And you know, most organizations are just completely not equipped to kind of, uh, you know, kind of deal with this. So, uh, you know, I think will passwordless happen? Uh, I'd say, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm optimistic that actually it will. And you know, while I don't exactly know how it's going to kind of play out from here, I think you know, a number of the panelists here. You know, actually, I was just starting with, uh, you know, Andrew and what he showed with Fido. And then, you know, the demo that Ori showed was fascinating. I think one of the things that, you know, just to touch on that for a moment is also the bootstrapping of an individual, you know, uh, into a system is often a, you know, very complex part. And, you know, I have a lot of admiration for what Ori is doing, you know, overall, but just that bootstrapping piece and the simplicity and what goes on behind that, uh, you know, so I think that's that's likely to be an important part of the future. I uh, actually have another laptop here, and I like to show people I actually have a YubiKey on it. So I think the, uh, you know, work that Skeena is doing, you know, and her company is doing is important. Uh, you know, and I think what Ping and, you know, Okta are doing just on business apps, uh, you know, is important. So I'm very hopeful, kind of, as I look at the future, right, the exact path is not clear. But I do think, you know, there will be a time when, uh, you know, password managers, you know, will be a relic, you know, and all these sticky notes of passwords will be a relic. So maybe that's a good place to stop and uh, yeah. turn it back to you, Andrew. Thanks, Machine. No, I think that's a great place to start. And really, you know, your perspective is a unique one, uh, both due to your kind of history in the Valley, but also, you know, you, you see a lot of companies come through your doors and, and you have a great feel for the landscape. So thank you. Um, so let's start with kind of backing up. So, you know, we've talked, you know, in our introductions about the problems of passwords, but Steve, let me start with you. I mean, how did we get here? I mean, it's not new that passwords are a problem. Um, you know, it's also kind of talking head song. You know, all of a sudden we find ourselves in the midst of a large data breach and we find ourselves like losing customers. But you know, how did we get here? And, and you know, what do you think the core problem is? And we talked a little bit about usability. We talked a little bit about security. You know, how, how do you look at this? I think you, you pointed out well, Andrew, when you started the presentation today. I mean, username and passwords are static information. Um, any static code uh, that is, you know, that can be copied remote will be copied. And so and we have to remember that it was only 30 years ago when the first website was launched. 30 years ago, the first website was launched and username password was more than enough because it was only designed for sharing information. It was not designed for security. So I think, you know, there is, we have to put that in perspective. The short time when this infrastructure, the whole world is dependent on is only 30 years old and it was not designed for security. And here we are 30 years later. Okay, you know, we need to patchwork it. The, the passwords, I probably don't, think that they will go away in the very soon time frame. I'm more focused on how do we make it simple and secure. If there is a password in the very bootstrapping moment, like with the FIDO U2F protocol that we created and is still, you know, the most common use FIDO protocol, then, you know, it is actually okay. You have a password and then you combine it with a key. And then you don't use either the key or the password every time you log in because it's it's bootstrap. I mean, that's, you know, you mentioned that, Ashim, you know, the importance of sort of tying a strong credential to your um, 
to your devices and to your services, and then it sort of just works. And um, that's where I believe things will be, be heading, um, with or without passwords, sure. as a bootstrap. Steve, did, did you have more to add to that? Uh, no, I'll, I'll let you continue. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's fine. no, it's interesting because we talk about security, we talk about usability, and I think the answer is yes, it's, it's both. Right, and they need to have both to, for this to, um, you know, to take root. But Candace, it's, it's interesting in, in your introduction, you know, talk about identity, and of course, you know, when I look at identity, I see you know authentication as a very narrow slice of identity, and that's you know, Fido's focus has been very narrow from the beginning because I actually use the same I use the same exact terminology as you. I see authentication is the tip of the spear um, in the battle against data breaches, but you see this is the tip of the spear in you know, identity. Um, so I'd be curious to see how you know how do you look at this from an identity centric perspective? Yeah, you know, with respect to kind of security or usability, kind of the topic we just talked about, I, I don't think you can talk about identity without taking into consideration both of those, right? So the reason we have a problem with passwords is not just because bad guys are good at figuring them out, but it's because people are, you know, we'll call it apathetic about ensuring that they secure their passwords, that their passwords are difficult enough. I mean, how many of us are support people for the people in our family as when it comes to security and their, their computer? How many of your family doesn't have a four-digit code on their bloody phone, right? Like, so my rule is if you want me to help you when your computer breaks, I'm going to get to nag you about putting secure passwords on your devices and your phone, right? So it's so like we know just from our personal experience that that you know, independent of whether or not people can figure out how to hack or, or break in or log in to your system, they don't need to in many cases because people make it so easy for them to get access to it. Now, that's kind of in the, in the consumer world. In the corporate world, obviously, there are IT and security mandates that require passwords. Um, and so for me, I think usability is it's hard, so I'm just going to use the same password every time, and I'll change a digit, and it'll be okay, right? Um, it, that's the usability issue. From a security perspective, the problem with the password is what, you know, Stina talked about earlier, uh, the reason that she created the YubiKey, right, was because it was pretty easy for people to figure out passwords, uh, fish, they can do key loggers, as Ori pointed out, and, and kind of capture um, or excuse me, Andrew pointed out, they can capture, you know, your, your SMS or whatever it might be. So from an identity perspective, you know, identity itself it is, you have a user identity, you have an identity life cycle, and that's regardless of the authentication process. So the authentication is, is to me kind of separate from identity. Um, you know, authentication methods used like passwords or biometrics or SMS or email or whatever those might be, um, they're required in order for us to be able to sure, to be assured that the person who's attempting to request access to a resource is in fact who they say they are. So, so, so to me, it's related, but identity is kind of the thing and, um, the authentication is related to that. And, and so, you know, passwordless is a way for us to kind of get away from, we'll call it the apathy that many people have when it comes to passwords and securing their devices with some form of authentication. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so we talked about, um, I think, Ashimi, you raised it, the, the, the need to, to bootstrap, you know, the identity. And that's that's part of the challenge, right? So FIDO's focus is narrow on just user authentication piece, but that initial, you know, onboarding, if you will, and, and getting that user on board. Um, and there's a lot of interesting work in, in that space happening right now, both in standards and with private Absolutely. companies, emerging companies. Yeah, it's real, and that's really the key to getting someone on board. And I see some stuff in the chat room, what happens if you lose your device and how do you get, you know, privacy and biometrics, all these things. And these are all things that are contemplated, need to be contemplated as we look at, you know, addressing that, that onboarding piece of the equation. Um, or, how, I mean, how does, when you're looking at, you know, the demo you showed is super compelling, super easy to use, you know, the, the Atlas one even better, right? It's basically, it's using WebAuthn, Fido2. Um, you know, how does, how do you treat the the idea of onboarding a user? And, and, and how, how do you think about that? And, as you look at that, you know, what are some you know, privacy considerations that, that people should be thinking about as well? Ashim, I'm going to answer your question. I know you talked about the bootstrapping, but I want to make it super clear. 
There are many ways to do it. None of them are more difficult than what bootstrapping is today. Let me give you some examples. The simplest way, if you'd go and download the Trisona app just to play with it, we'd ask you for an email address. We'll send you an email. You'll click on a magic link and you're bootstrapped. Of course, with that level of assurance, but that is what it takes. It takes for you to validate something to get going. So it could be as simple as an email magic link. Now, of course, for workforce solutions, let's talk about Okta. We have a chiclet in there. So after you log into Okta with username and password, hopefully for the last time, you click on a chiclet that shows you a QR code and you scan it. And now we just inherent from Okta their UPN or their user ID into the thing. And that's it. From that moment on, you can just keep on logging on without username and password. So that is the onboarding in that system. Uh, I can tell you when you want to open a bank account or if you really need to authenticate when you're on your first day at work on a remote network, you can scan a driver license and we'll go say, yeah, this is a shame check. So the moment of connecting your phone and the security key on it to your identity is really dependent on what's the use case. Netflix doesn't need anything more secure than a email magic link and maybe getting into your bank account needs something higher. That is a decision, and I agree with Candice, let's not mix authentication and the identity because you can have a very low grade identity that is authenticated in the highest level possible and vice versa, a very strong identity. But so think if I go to the DHS, I, a TSA traveler, not that we're flying anywhere, but I go to an in-person identity proofing, they check my, right? That's a very strong identity session. And imagine for me to go home just with username and password to log back into my account. I mean, that's a very low authentication to a very strong identity. So I think the information is what you want it to be. And then per use case, we need to match it. I don't believe that one size is a fit all to all the use cases we see if the world is to go passwordless. No, I think that's a good point. You know, the, the you know, different use cases obviously mandate different levels of assurance or or confidence in, in the uh, and, and rigor, if you will, in, in how you get this information out to people, how you, how you onboard new users and how you let them authenticate themselves. Um, Ashim, I see you nodding in violent agreement. Let me let me ask you a question. So so, what are you seeing in 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 the startup community? You know, um, is this a growth area? Everyone sees this as a problem. You know, I, I'm fortunate enough to see a lot of innovative companies and in Fido Alliance or prospective members even, a lot of really cool technology out there. But is there a market opportunity, you know, in, in this space as an ISV um, or as a vendor? The scene has proven that hardware sells well as, as well. Um, but a software vendor, hardware vendor, is, you know, how should, an entre- how should an entrepreneur look at this space? Yeah, so it's a it's a great question. Uh, you know, so I would say this uh, this general area, right? You know, most people would put it under what's called identity and access management, you know, or uh, abbreviated as IAM, and you know that's one of the large buckets in uh, cybersecurity, right? So if you think of, think of things like uh, you know network security being a very large bucket, or think of endpoint security, you know, IAM would be like a major bucket like that, and so. Uh, you know, it's also worth noting just with cyber, right, and cybersecurity, right? Cybersecurity tends to follow IT. So as IT uh, architectures evolve, you know, you can almost think of cyber as kind of a wrapper, but kind of following cyber, uh, you know, following IT. And then I think as, you know, everyone in the audience is, you know, well aware, uh, you know, uh, just in terms of a macro trend, right? Uh, you know, there are some macro trends right now that we're all part of, right? You know, that's, uh, you know, digital transformation be one of them. Journey to the cloud would be another one, right? And I would actually, you know, offer up like, you know, just, uh, you know, leveraging AI and ML as a third kind of, let's just say, macro trend. So if you put that, you just take that as a backdrop, right? Most organizations, most individuals are, you know, are, are on a journey to cloud, uh, you know, whether that's consumer services or enterprise services, you know, organizations are digitally transforming and most organizations are trying to figure out how to use you know, AI, ML, predictive analytics, statistical techniques, you know, with almost unlimited compute and, you know, kind of memory available to them for the first time ever, right? Uh, You know, and and how do you leverage that, right? Uh, To basically, you know, a variety of things. 
So you take all of that and now you bring it back to this area, right? Uh, passwordless, right? So uh, I would say, you know, there's a, so just to maybe add a few themes, right? One is there's a plethora of biometric uh, things out there, right? And then these have been around for many, many years, right? And they've historically been quite niche, right? They've been niche based on complexity of implementation. There's also been social issues around them, right? So, you know, even if these were broadly available, not everybody wants to look into a retina scanner, right? Or that may, may not be socially acceptable. But I think, you know, you are going to see biometric evolve. And I think if you look at what Apple has certainly done there, right? And how they've brought this technology, you know, uh, into a mass market, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's impressive. And so you have to look at it, maybe Apple, Android, and, you know, look at also what Microsoft is doing, you know, you know things like Window Hello for Business or, you know, other techniques. So I think biometrics is going to continue to evolve. You know, we see different companies doing niche things around there. There's, be, there's also a wave of companies. It's worth, it's worth noting there's a wave of companies out there that look at how you type, right? And yeah. try to basically identify, hey, Andrew types a particular way or Ori types a particular way or Sheen types a particular way, right? That's kind of one piece. I'd say another piece more recently we've seen, right? And there, there are startup companies out there doing uh, platforms, and these are kind of platforms that integrate with like Windows or Mac, you know, to basically, you know, enable access for, again, for like, I would say for workstations, uh, you know, or for tablets. And they typically are using, you know, phone as a second factor, right? Or, so on, or, or using your phone as a token. And so I'd say that's, there's a wave of, you know, companies out there doing that. And then maybe I'll just touch on, you know, one other theme, right? Which is really, uh, you know, using data. Right, so essentially each of us has a unique fingerprint in terms of things that we touch out there. And if someone could intercept, you know, that at varying levels, right, that does create a data feed. And then that data feed basically can create a unique fingerprint. So the question becomes really, how do you get that intersection point? But if you take a financial institution, right, you know, and you know, all of us, you know, let's say if you deal with a particular financial, that financial institution can be a fingerprint so they may know that I, I typically log in from particular locations and I typically log in from particular devices and then it would be pretty rational if I'm not coming in from one of those devices or from you know one of those locations where I typically come in to maybe step up security right or, or you know certain transactions could be viewed as lower grade and less risk and other transactions could be viewed as higher risk so I think you know some of that last piece and applying you know data techniques around that and again applying you know ai ml statistical techniques whatever you want to call it right i think i think some of those things you know have some type of future as well and we are seeing companies around that uh, mm -hmm. i'll just add and say like you know sometimes people call those last that last area also continuous authentication so just to put another terminology out there so maybe that's a good place to stop yeah yeah no it's, you touched on a lot of things and i think the i mean but, let me kind of rephrase a little bit. I think you hit on something we hadn't talked about yet, which is the importance of risk scoring, right? All this stuff. And then we already talked about it a little bit, like it depends on, on the use case, the level of assurance one wants to find. Um, and so we see a lot of kind of, you know, machine learning or ML driven models that allow for risk scoring based on these different attributes. So if you're talking about behavioral biometrics or data exhaust, if you will, for the user, you know, does they usually walk the limb for the left hand or whatever it might be. And, where you're logging in, these are all things that can feed into a risk engine to help someone assess based on the use case, whether or not they want to grant that authentication or if they require some, some level of step up, I suppose. It's interesting. Uh, you know, can yeah, I mean, sorry, maybe I could just jump in and add, yeah, and just to yeah. also just add a little bit more framing there, right? I would say, so if you look at passwordless, right? So it's really like, you know, Fido, then there's, you know, there's all the stuff Windows is doing, there's what Apple is doing, then you have certs and smart cards, then you have biometrics, you have phone as a token. So there's a variety of things. And you saw some of the, you know, both what Ori, Stina, and, you know, Candice represent in terms of their companies, the different, you know, bits and elements of this. So I think it's almost like there's a multi, there's multifaceted approaches. And these all, you know, these, some of these all have different places in the way this is going to play forward. I just want to add one thing. I think two major um, sort of foundation of the future will be based on 
two open standards. Uh, one that ping identity was actually a leading driver and contributed to the open uh, open ID uh, that came from SAML. And then um, I do think that FIDO web Authn will be one of those pieces and will come in so many different shapes and forms that we have only seen a fraction of them yet. <laughs> but with those two open standards, we got the identity standard and we got the authentication standard and they're merged together. And there, you know, there will be, they, I mean, if you look at what Apple and Microsoft are doing, yes, they do Windows Hello, but they also do FIDO. Um, and it's sort of becoming the, same ecosystem because the, the Windows Hello is you know mainly based to log into that service with that device, but doesn't work across services and cross devices. So you find always that sort of bridge uh, cross platform and devices. Um, so I honestly believe that the, the, these two open standards is going to be the future of authentication and identity and uh, it's going to open up a lot of uh, new innovation and business model that we have not yet seen. Yeah. Because when we can trust the internet, when we can actually do distributed trusted identity uh, in a, you know, uh, we will see things that we haven't seen today. Um, I, I agree with Stina, but I do want to give all of us some word of caution because we're all technology nerds and we love what we develop. I'm going to tell you the one important thing I've learned in my journey in the last five years is that user experience is everything. I don't care how strong the security is and how cool it is. Give it to your parents. If they cannot make it work, who cares? I used to not think that. I used to focus so much on the bits and bytes and I was blinded that when you hand over the beautiful technology you develop to somebody who is not a technologist, for them, they don't care. They just want it to work. So all I'm saying is every standard is so, so important. Every standard should be very ubiquitous and available, and it has to be usable. If you want to study about this, go see uh, uh, articles or lectures by Jared Spool. He's one of the gurus of user experience. And even though he did not come from our space as security people, when he looks at what we do, he says, if it's not usable, it's not secure. Now, here's an example. Say that we were all CISOs and we told our employees, you will have a 20 character username and password because I say so. And now everybody is forced to put a 20 character username and password. You think they can remember it? No. So what are they going to do? Write it on a little sticky note and put it on their screen. So yes, I forced them to do the thing that I think is good, but they went around me because it wasn't usable. And I would just caution all of us in our kind of a startup journey and companies make sure that the dog wants to eat the dog food. Otherwise we can fall in love with our own technologies, but we're blinded to the fact that others need to use it. Very good point. I've had a lot of engineers over the years say, yeah, but really large enterprises have great IT teams. They don't care as much about usability. And I always said, I have yet to have a single customer tell me that they would rather it was hard because they have lots of talent that can work around that. Everyone wants it simple, brain dead, easy to use. And if they need to drill down to get more advanced capabilities, they're willing to do that. But make my first interaction with it feel really good and really simple. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. So, and, and or I know, you know, Tristana invests a lot in user experience and, and you know, um, we do a lot of surveys and, and research ourselves, and, and there's a big chunk of the population doesn't want to give up their passwords because it's a known thing. And while they might not like passwords, they know how to work around them, or they just do a password reset every time. That's the best way to have a you know secure password. It's amazing the way people work around passwords because they have to. And so we're doing research now on on usability. What's the best way to, to actually implement this to get someone to you know feel like they want to move towards a FIDO-based login and to lose their password. Are they actually comfortable with that? There's a lot of, you know, so in theory, yes, it's all kumbaya and, and nice and easy to log in with a biometric or Windows Hello or Touch ID. There's, you know, that's disconcerting for a lot of people. Um, and so there's there's a lot of, you know, things to take in con consideration as we work over the next couple of years to make, you know, this broader vision a market reality. I want to mention one thing about biometrics. Um, so yeah, you know, FIDO has a, a biometric um, <clears throat> protocol to support biometrics. Um, I agree, it's a shame that, you know, Apple did the that segment of the, the, the marketplace, you know, a really solid service by introducing Touch ID. Right? Touch ID was a new thing. It actually 
taught people also the importance of locking their phones, which is an adjacent uh, topic to talk about. But Touch ID became a thing. And all of a sudden, people became like, oh, yeah, this is a nice way to unlock my phone. And, you know, the fundamental shift that I think we're collectively trying to make is that, yeah, the same way you use Touch ID or Face ID, you can now use to log in to uh, a website or to access a service. And I think that's a very important shift that needs to be made in the market. And Apple did us all a favor by introducing a branded authenticator, basically. And now we see Windows doing the same thing with Windows Hello for business and for consumers. Android, of course, is extensive biometric support as well. So I think that things like that, that brand recognition, that consumer acceptance of using a biometric is really important. We you know, I've seen some questions coming in, some questions about privacy and biometrics. Um, you know, I personally feel in Fido, uh, you know, Fido's principles, uh, feel that biometrics need to stay on the device. All right. So I think it's really important as we look at if you look at biometrics as a you know mechanism of doing better authentication, that we need to protect consumers and leaving them on the device is one way of preventing any sort of you know major biometric breach. Um, Agreed. So, so Candace, as as kind of the incumbent you know identity you know vendor on on this panel, um, and things certainly come a long way in, in twenty something years. But as the incumbent you know vendor, how are you keeping up with these? you know, changes in, you know, user authentication and, and what are you hearing from customers? How are you planning on delivering that in product? Um, how's this impacting yeah. your future roadmap as the chief product officer at Thing Identity? Yeah, so it's definitely having an impact. Cer certainly, you know, I think every company, gra and on our, we sell uh, to, to B2B, not, you know, directly to consumer. Um, and, you know, every company is struggling with, kind of password management and how to create a more secure authentication process. And you know, Ping's been in the authentication business for a long time. Um, obviously, I think, I don't know if it's 20, I think it's 18. I'm Like I said, I joined May of last year, so I'm still kind of learning the history. But that's a really long time to be an identity, uh, given, you know, we've needed it for, what, 30 years? And we've been in it for nearly half of that or over half of that. So I think the way it's altered our our kind of strategy is really by extending um, our passwordless capability. Obviously, you know things like the QR code scanning, biometrics, those kinds of capabilities. I mean, SMS and text. Hey, it's not the greatest, but it's better than just a pure password, right? And so, enabling customers to have a variety of ways in which they can put together a program. That will helpfully be palatable to you know both their customers because we we serve both the customer identity use case as well as the workforce identity use case, and you know with it with a workforce you can tell them what they're going to do and hope they do it even if they try to circumvent it as you know you guys pointed out in the customer case if, if it's a bad identity experience they may just go find another company to work with right so you really have to think about what what kind of experience is my customer going to have with me the first time and the second time they log in so if the first time they log in they got to do the whole password thing and after that they can get to a point where hey now i can just use a biometric or i can have them send me a code or I can use a QR code. You've simplified that process for them with every subsequent interaction with your organization, and that's really important. I think other areas where I think, um, well, I know we're making investments, and I think the market is going to go this way. Is you know, um, the first is really around verification and proofing. We just released a product at the beginning of February that basically does um, ID verification. So you can do a facial match, a live facial match to a, a driver's license, for example, where if you need to verify that you are who you say you are and they want a live match, you have the ability to do that. I personally think that that, that has a lot of legs as you begin to think of all the different kinds of documents we have, whether that's a passport, a military ID, maybe a training uh, certification or an educational credential, the ability to leverage kind of a an application to use that as your vehicle for verification when someone's asking you to prove you are who you are or that you have the credentials you say you do. I think that's going to be incredibly powerful going forward. I think it's got a lot of room to grow. I think there's a lot of companies that are that are looking at that space as Ashim has pointed out and certainly as Ori is working on. But the second area I think that is nascent and um I find extremely interesting, Ashim referred to, which is really um, 
that whole, what I kind of call contextual or risk-based identity, considering the, the environmental elements around any given request for access. So, you know, if I'm Candace and I haven't traveled for a year and all of a sudden, you know, I'm logging in from somewhere overseas, maybe we should like just do a check or require an additional level of authentication. Maybe if I'm accessing an application uh, that I have legitimate access to, but again, I haven't accessed that application and downloaded a bunch of data onto my hard drive ever, um, you know, maybe again, I need to revalidate that this is in fact Candace require, you know, some additional form of authentication. So that ability to look at all of those contextual elements around any request in a dynamic way, not a static way. So if something changes in the middle of that interaction and now Candace is adding, acting oddly, maybe I ask her for, sorry, that was my webcam. Um, maybe I ask her for another level of, of you know, authentication to prove that she still is at her computer and she is who she says she is. And you know, we released something in this area at the end of December. Uh, I think, I think if we can get that right, where we can look at all of those contextual elements and come to a conclusion for what we might call low risk interactions, maybe we can just eliminate passwords for that. And for those higher risk interactions where we're talking to a broker or a bank account, you know, a bank or, or maybe our healthcare record, maybe we require an up level in you know, whether we're using QR codes or biometrics or, or et cetera. So we, we've really kind of changed our strategy to kind of look at where that puck is going relative to, to uh, kind of passwordless or what I like to call frictionless security. And, and I think FIDO is part of that. You know, we were a member and we, we actually just achieved certification for FIDO2, which we're pretty excited about. So I think that there's a lot of opportunities with various technologies as it relates to making passwordless real as opposed to an intellectual exercise. Mm. You know, you raised an important F word, um, which is friction. Um, and, you know, let's talk about friction a little bit. I'd love to get everyone's feedback on what's the right level of friction, right? Sometimes something seems too easy. You think it's not secure. So people put up like a, a capture or something to add some artificial friction so people feel better about their login experience. I mean, um, I'd be curious to get other thoughts on this. Do we, you know, should, does a, does a level of friction, is some level of friction necessary to make consumers feel comfortable? And is that so something today? Is that something that they'll always want to have? And then also like for highly secure use cases, you know, what level of friction do you want to make sure is there um, for, you know, more uh, precious resources? You know, I can I can uh, throw a quick example of something that's uh, relatively low friction. So, you know, there's one particular financial services website that I use. Where what did uh, what you uh, you know when I go there, I just put my email address in, and what happens is then it, uh, essentially a a text message shows up on my cell phone with a code, and then I just type the code in, and and I'm in. Now, you know, that may have some people you know saying. Uh, you know that that's not very secure, right? Or because there was no initial password at all. But I'm kind of fascinated by that, as just you know, as a way. So essentially, you know, if somebody has my cell phone, uh, then you know, yeah, you could say I'm I'm hosed, right? At, in, in that scenario. But uh, hmm. but it's that's also it's also it's also kind of a relief. Like there's one less password to deal with. I remember, <laughs> you know, so you just go there and like, yeah. It's primary. They use that primarily for informational, like so. If you want statements and things like that, like yeah, it's a, it's well, a, yeah, it's it's actually it's actually a financial aggregator. Yeah, that okay. that does that. Yeah, where basically they aggregate reporting across. Uh, yeah, so I think that's a good example of where people. I mean, so I I think that sounds like a kind of risky practice. I mean, to me personally, so SIM swapping things like that, you can be a fish. But with step up, right? So I, presumably, if you're going to do some sort of transaction, you'd then have to to the next level of you know some other you know. Some other proof, I, I would think. Um, you know, the the Ori's demo sh I think showed an example. Where maybe you're talking about using it for Hulu or Amazon or things like that, or Netflix. Where people are, you know, they're accustomed to people sharing passwords, or maybe they're probably more eager to have someone actually log on than really worry about who that is, you know, doing something. Whereas if they're changing their billing, presumably they'd want to add some level of friction into the authentication process. I would think. It's, certainly, for me, it feels like if I'm looking for information. Um, 
and and there's not you know a payment involved there's not access to a healthcare record or a financial account or you know my work resources if i'm just out there looking for information it drives me crazy when i have to like log in and give you know seven fields of data just to be able to download a report um or just to be able to get you know some information off the bank website because they want me to log into it before they'll actually let me access just basic information. I think when you start looking at what people want to steal, payment information, uh, personal I you know PII, uh, healthcare records, anything that becomes extremely interesting in one of those massive data dumps you referenced, Andrew, like yeah. that's where there should be friction. And that friction might vary from, you know, it's my access to Pinterest, which I've purchased one thing off of in the last five years. So the likelihood that the credit card they have on file isn't even valid anymore versus I'm accessing my brokerage account. And I want to, I want a step up probably two or three steps up depending on what kind of transaction I'm doing. So I think that that friction is necessary. Um, whether or not it has to be there to make pe people feel safe, I think that's an interesting question. I think there's a false sense of security in some cases just by asking people to you know, fill out credentials. Because um, we, we all know that just because you put in a credential doesn't mean that the site is safe. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, while we're talking about consumers in this kind of friction context, you know, of course, the enterprise is, you know, I think friction is less of a concern, um, but, you know, it, you still want to be easy. So, Stina, you're talking about the Google study, um, which proved that over, you know, this longitudinal study, multi-year study, where thanks to using YubiKeys or security keys, not one person was fished and their support costs went down and general, you know, happiness, I think was the term they said, went up. You know, people did people, the usability um, feedback was quite positive. You know, it's interesting. I, I see, um, you know, YubiKeys. Um, there's kind of a, almost like a cult following uh, um, of, you know, of people who love the keys. You know, and so I think what you've managed to do. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think actually you're right. I mean, when I started this company, people say, oh, hardware tokens, that's probably yeah. the things that I hate the most. Why are you want to be in this business? <laughs> so but, it's interesting how actually we've been able to, to create a brand um, that, I mean, and it's and it is thanks to Fido. I mean, to to make it an open standard because it's we made hardware keys simple. Um, it, it, hardware keys in general, people don't like. And uh, by the way, Ashim, when I came here to Silicon Valley, I, I tried to get investors. I couldn't succeed in the beginning, actually. And and I, I went up and down on Sand Hill Road, and there was one investor who said. First, they all said, we don't like hardware. <laughs> and then one person said, um, in this firm, we only invest in the future and you're not the future. So that, that was a hard, yeah. hard uh, sort of. But, um, you know, I, don't, I think there is the reason why we are, companies and people are starting to like keys. And by the way, our YubiKeys is sort of the original security key. There are other keys out there, not, not only us. It's, it's a combination of, um, we are driving the standard. You know, we are helping to drive these standards. Um, we, we're trying to be very transparent <laughs> of how, when we have any security issue. Um, we um, have made it easy. Um, the reason why people have been able to um, get down the support was actually not, um, I, I wasn't expecting it, but in the Google study, they realized that when they only gave one key, then the support cost got up because people maybe lose it, just like you lose a phone or your you know, computer. But if they give two or three keys, suddenly the support cost got, went down because now there was a backup. And I think that is a super critical part of this whole ecosystem that whatever method we have, that we need to have a, another and we need another backup. We need something that is, you know, because you're going to lose your phone. You're going to break your phone. You're going to lose your computer. You're going to, you know, something is going to happen. And what do you log in with then that is as secure and as easy? Because now the backups are being fished at scale. You know, if you have a security key and you have an SMS as a backup, then they're going to take the SMS. <laughs> so um, anyway. I would love to, to echo what Stina is saying and add some other research that uh, people should be aware of because I know when new technology is introduced, 
And the cycle is always people are worried and then they accept it. So if you go back in time to the airline industry, no one wanted to go on the first plane. If you go to the elevator industry, people did not want to ride it without an operator. And the LASIK surgery is an example from our time. No one wants to be first to get LASIK, right? Uh, let another million people do it before me. The research, I think, is very clear uh, when it comes to passwordless. Let me share some data. If you force people to go passwordless, you get resistance because they're thinking, oh, you're telling me what to do. But if you offer it as an add-on, as an option, all of a sudden, seven out of 10 users pick it because they're curious and they hate passwords, so they try it. So seven out of 10 will pick it if you don't force them to. And more interesting, the other 30% who didn't even give it a shot, you know, call them the laggards or the people who are shy, if you send one email reminder that this option is available, it's called priming, 94% of them who tried it, stick with it. So you're going to get to higher 90s of adoption if you do what I said before, which is user testing, user experience, real research, as opposed to us being technologists in the lab, thinking that the world is going to love what we did. It doesn't work this way. Listen to people, ask them what they want, and you'll see that great technology and ubiquity and the right rollout, like how you approach them, what words you use, what options you give them, that's what's going to make the world passwordless and not just technology. So, Stina, you've learned that yourself. Just giving one key is not going to work. And that's humans that we're talking about. They lose things, their cat ate it, whatever, right? If we take great technology, but also go ask our users, does this work for you? Does it do the thing I think my vision has invented? If we don't do that extra step, who cares? But I'm telling you, enough companies who do user testing, user acceptance, and UX are discovering what works, and they will help usher this world. Technology alone never Never will, so I should never invest in people who say, I don't care to test it with users. I think it's great, right? Don't invest in those guys. But the combination of usability and security, that's what's going to make it work. That's, I, think you're, I think you're absolutely right, Ori. And, and, and again, I, I know this is an area, you know, user testing, user experience is an area where which is deeply invested in and it shows, frankly. Um, so you talk about password lists. And let me just kind of raise the question as we start to wrap up before we turn to audience questions. Do we need to go passwordless, right? Do we tr do we need there's passwordless experience, and then there's a true passwordless architecture, right? So the slide I showed with the the uh, credential theft cycle is talking about getting passwords off the server, basically replacing them with public keys so they can't be stolen and reused stuff. Blah 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 blah. The passwordless user experience is you know touch ID today. Frankly, for most most applications, there's still a password sitting there, so it's more like a password manager. Um, what do we need? What's the right balance? Do we need to go truly passwordless to get the passwords off the server? Does it need to be passwordless experience? Is it kind of a phasing type thing where we start with the passwordless experience and move the passwords off the servers? What do you all think? And then let's turn it. Let's take some questions from the audience. Who wants to bite? Yeah, I mean, I'd say you know, I mean, clearly, what one wants is the experience, right? And so, and then, you know, however that's in it. You know, so be it, right? I mean, at some level, and maybe that ties back to the point you know Ori was making as well. Just which you know, I couldn't agree with more. Which is end of the day, you know, security is about usability and about security as an, as an enabler, right? Versus security as a barrier, right? And so, uh, so I would say anything that can kind of you know uh, enable the experience, right? I mean, that's kind of what the future is. And then you know, under the hood, how it may work, right? I mean, kind of you know, at some level, so be it. And uh, you know, and uh, you know, and I, you know, one question I actually have around that, right? Which I was tempted to ask actually Stina a while back uh, on this panel is, or actually for, for any of us, is will the Apple system be open? You know, or is there, or to what level is that actually open for third parties? Um, the a bit of a naive question, yeah. <laughs> the Fido to um, uh, iPhone and and uh, iOS system uh, and Mac is open for FIDO authenticators. Yes. If you if you if you ask that, you can use either uh, Lightning or USB um, C in Max or NFC. So all those three um, communication methods are open for, for Apple. But it's you know you have to 
it doesn't mean that you today can use every service with Apple with this. So you know, Apple have opened up the communications, but it's so they can use the devices, but it doesn't mean that you can actually log into Apple services yet with with a FIDO authenticator. It's you can use their devices, but not their services okay, at this I time. See. They've also layered in support for WebAuth and FIDO2 with the latest release of Safari and, and Mac OS, so, such that you can use Touch ID on, on the Mac desktop to log into sites that support WebAuth. So an example of this, and I encourage, I always get the question, well, who's using WebAuth today? One great example that you know many people use is eBay. If you go to eBay.com uh, and you're on a Windows machine, a Mac machine, or Android device, um, you can have the option of actually you know, using your, your platform biometric, is what we call it. Um, so I think that in that sense, a shame that th th these are open standards, right? So there's, the, and the, they're open APIs, they're not hiding, Apple is is not, you know, using proprietary APIs for the FIDO calls, which is good. And I, by the way, I think that's brilliant that it is being, people have said, Stina, why we need, we need in the future in the security keys? I actually believe that there, in the future, there will be a lot of built-in authenticators directly into computers, into phones, into TPMs, into secure enclaves and, and ARM processes. And those are going to pave the way for the, you know, the mass majority of everyone who needs to log in securely on the internet. And then you still need, for a lot of use cases, external authenticators uh, as, a, as a bootstrapping to move mm -hmm. across devices, to move with, to legacy systems, um, for shared workstations, for high privacy needs. There are all kind of sort of additions, but the Definitely. 4 billion people on the internet are, are, should not have to go and buy a YubiKey. That's not my mission, <laughs> just so <laughs> everyone knows. <laughs> but I, I, I think that positioning is absolutely spot on. You know, they're, they're, it's highly complimentary. So Andrew, if we if we go back to your question, yeah. just around yeah. is is the experience that we have right now good enough? Where you know there's maybe multiple ways for people to log in beyond a password, or do we need to eliminate them completely and go to a totally passwordless kind of architecture? I think that was the gist of your question. Yes, it was. I, I think what well, what maybe worth kind of thinking about is um, have have the ways in which we've enabled a more frictionless approach to identity actually put us in the position where people are going to care less about moving to a complete architecture. So I think the average user or employee, if they can just use their fingerprint or their face or, you know, that, uh, um, you know, a, a, an SMS in concert with their password, they're, they're probably pretty satisfied with that. Hey, it was pretty fast. It was pretty painless compared to having to remember, you know, 75 passwords. Um, so I think security people are going to care a lot about the architecture. I think the end user, at least for the foreseeable future, they may think that the you know the capabilities that we have now around QR code or biometrics are just fine. Hey, it's pretty easy compared to what they had to do in the past. And so I think that that architectural discussion may be driven by IT teams and security professionals to ensure the you know there's better security of corporate infrastructure. And that may end up trickling down to end users because it's kind of driven to them. I mean, how, how many of us experience using a password at work before we ever put one on our home systems? Like I can't be the only person in the universe that, that was that person, right? And so I think a lot of times those practices get driven down to employees at work and then they start to kind of trickle into the personal lives of employees. And that's a lot of times how a technology takes hold. And I think that's what we may see here. I think people have gotten pretty comfortable with that thumbprint or that fingerprint. Do we need an architecture? Well, they probably don't care, but boy, do the corporate IT and security people care? Absolutely, if they can get there. I think that's a great point, and I want to strengthen it by opposing it, and you'll see what I mean. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I think in corporate ITs, which we've, we've all worked for, uh, you know, the corps, uh, you don't have a lot of choice, to be honest with you. You are told what to do. You're going to use this, and like, I, and I worked at the bank. Okay, here's the RSA token. You're going to wait until the numbers change. You're going to enter it even five times. Who cares? That's what we use. And I couldn't say no, and I couldn't say do you have it in pink, right? There was no other option. It's this or nothing. And I agree with you. In those days. 
you would take that experience to your home and expect as a consumer, okay, systems work like this. These people know what's good for me. But I think what Andrew said about Touch ID changed the world. All of a sudden, you had Apple breaking the rules by saying, you know what, with your fingerprint, you now can do all those things that required up until a year ago, a six-digit pin to unlock the phone, right? And I do think that the world will reverse, especially with BYOD, because people will ask the obvious question, IT, why can't I unlock my network the same way I unlock my phone? And if Touch ID is like your little LAN, like the local area on your phone, why can't I extend it to the WAN? And I do think we will get some pushback from uh, the new generation that is coming behind us to say, you guys are old and stodgy, make it work. Here, Apple did it, you should do it. And I do think if we don't think this way, it, it will change without having a good architecture. So I, I'm, I agree with you, but I think we need to open our eyes to the next generation after us. To them, everything should be a touch of a button, uh, biometrics, beep, beep, bop, and I'm in. And they expect us to adapt to that versus the other way. Yeah, I actually think we're in violent agreement. I don't think we, we disagree at all. I'm just saying, I think, you know, users have gotten used to that. I think to go to the, the pure kind of passwordless architecture, as long as the user gets to use their thumbprint or they get to use a QR code or whatever it is, they could care less what the backend architecture looks like. Right. Yeah. It's it's the it's the security IT geeks that are really caring about caring about that. And that was really my point, Ori, is that like I think I think they care about the architecture. Those people who are just like saying make this as easy as possible don't really care what's behind the curtain, right? right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Nor should they. They shouldn't, but they they, they, so they don't want their credentials to be you know out in the dark web eventually. So I think there's probably Great. some kind of hy hybrid approach where initially you know you have your, you keep your password, you know it's still there as kind of a, you know, for a security purpose or the feeling of security as a user. While the security professionals work behind the scenes to actually get those things off the servers to to mitigate yep. their own risk. Because we always say our position passwords to the enterprise is a liability. You know, as long as you have these things sitting there in your servers. You're going to, they're going to be attacked and it's a liability because you, you don't want to be in Capitol Hill talking about the data breach of your company. You don't want, you know, if you're a CISO, you don't want to be in the headlines. Um, so I think it's an yeah. interesting, interesting transition we'll be facing. Um, so a couple of minutes, around five minutes um, before I turn things back over to the VLAB folks. We have some questions. First of all, I, I see several questions about biometrics. Can they be hacked? Are they safe? So I just want to, you know, clarify this again with the FIDO approach generally. Uh, the biometrics of Touch ID, Face ID, Android fingerprint, these things are stored locally on your device. Um, so it's stored it, 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 within the, you know, the secure element or the secure part of the device and they don't leave your device. If you see, you know, services, and it's fair to ask your service provider, you know, where are my biometrics being stored? Um, you know, I think you want to find services that, that store them locally and, and don't do so in the cloud, which eliminates the, the chance of them being hacked at scale. Um, we have some questions about usability in the context of seniors or kind of, you know, at, you know, less savvy users who either don't have, or may have someone has a, a disability. Um, or let me turn to you. I mean, you've done a lot of user testing. How do you think about users with disabilities and, and making the login experience as easy as it is for them as for someone who's has the ability to, you know, freely use their hands, for example? It's a wonderful question. When we deal with universities, this comes up all the time because they simply cannot buy solutions that don't match ADA and other uh, disability you know, guidelines, especially by the way, state schools. So if you're an entrepreneur listening to this, just so you know, your business plan cannot only include your friends and people you know, you have to think about all the user types and all the different things you need to comply with. Uh, we found that most of the operating systems of the phones already have taken care of the instructions. For example, we have done some testing with our software with blind people. And you will tell me they can't scan a QR code. Believe it or not, they can because they've done this before and the voice uh, help commands. So if you've ever wanted to try this, just turn your phone to one of those modes and you'll see how, what a wonderful job I think Android and uh, Apple have done to make it easier. So for us developers, we don't have to worry or reinvent the wheel. I don't know that it's as easy as uh, using it with people who have all their uh, abilities, but it is absolutely usable and we test it all the time. I will say more things that I found through research that surprised us 
is I'll give you two examples. During COVID, people with masks on, their face ID did not work because who would have thought that all of us will wear a mask? So <laughs> that thing kind of broke the pattern a little bit. And in another user, uh, uh, set of users, the factory employees that had gloves on and for them to take off the glove to use Touch ID was more work than typing in a password. So again, there's no one size fits all. It depends on the use case and what level of assurance but you will discover all these things by really doing user testing, which I'd highly recommend anybody in technology, because then you'll know what really happens, not in your eco chamber, but out there in the real world. Will the vast majority of consumer services offer a passwordless option by 2025? So four years from now, um, yes or no? Um, and then feel free to expand on your answer. So let me start with Stina, because you're in my top left. Will there be passwordless options for consumers, for ma mainstream consumers, consumer services? I believe that the FIDO web Authn, uh, which has the option to be passwordless, will be deployed by a lot of online services. And we're already seeing, you know, significant adoption, including from, you know, <laughs> panels on this, you know, people on this panel. Um, so, uh, yes, um, it, I would say not all, but the majority of the large will have. Harping on what I said before, if the question is, will everybody stop using password and move to passwordless? The answer is no for the next 20 years because there is never a thing that everybody jumps to. If the question is, will many brands add the option to go passwordless? The answer is yes. I believe that in many markets, such as say banking, the minute the big one will do it, everybody else will follow, just no one wants to be first and so on and so on in airlines and other industries that just look for the innovator to do something and everybody follows. I do believe in the next four years, people will add this because once they see the cool factor that people really love it and stick with it, it will be a no brainer. But I understand that no one wants to go first, so we need a few brave companies, but they're coming. I'm sure Stina yeah. knows who they are, I know who they are. They're working on this future as we speak. Good. Candace, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think a lot of companies will add it. I just think it's going to be, you know, to some extent, it's going to be a demand by consumers. You know, there there are, there's a whole, there's what, two or three generations who are now kind of digital natives that are used to living in this world. And they're not going to want to do business with people who make it hard. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, especially as we move out of COVID, there were, you know, there were a lot of, I, I would say, areas where maybe people weren't doing a lot of purchasing online or engaging online. There were a lot of people who still didn't bank online or maybe didn't buy as much stuff online. Well, COVID changed that for everybody, didn't it? Like, so do we all think coming out of COVID, they're going to go back to their old habits? Absolutely not. They may go back to some of them, but I bet they're still buying a lot more online after COVID than they were before. I bet they're still doing a lot more of their we'll call it services interaction online than they were before. And I think as a result of that, that's going to, that's going to drive a lot of the, the consumer maybe focused um, services to be contemplating how do we make this process easier and passwordless is a great, a great way to do that. You know, you get the bonus of it also being secure, but you know, it's easy for the end user. Okay, and Shane, I'll, I'll finish with you, but with a twist on it, because I want to throw a twist in. Do you think things we go in passwordless, but also from a from a you know entrepreneurial stand you know perspective, um, is this opportunity growing for companies in this space? And, and you know, how, how bullish are you on that space? Yeah, so I'd like to disagree with everybody else, but I find myself agreeing as well, which is I think you know this is a trend that's, that, that has legs. And I think, you know, 2025, uh, in, you know, if you took 2025, I would say, yes, the major uh, services, you know, will support passwordless. I agree with the nuance, you know, already added as well that, you know, it'll be an option and then it'll be an option that grows. Uh, so, I, and, you know, it's worth noting the major services typically have large security teams internally. So for them to do it, it's actually, I consider that a lower hurdle bar. And so I think the next question then becomes, you know, will a growing number of services on the net you know, kind of support this, right? And I think this, maybe I'll tie that back to your question, Andrew, just on the entrepreneurial side. I think, you know, as you kind of, you know, go into a long tail of services, right? So typically these businesses don't have the expertise in-house. So I think this, you know, likely creates an opportunity, right? For, 
you know, new entrepreneurial companies, right? Take passwordless as a service, make an API call, you get a result back, right? And then can you serve that up in a consumption pricing model or whatever mm-hmm. might be appropriate, right? So I think I think I think there's there's possibly opportunity there. There's opportunity, you know, in taking data and the whole risk-based scoring. You know, uh, you know that feels like that's an opportunity area that's still very ripe. And you know, one last one, which you know we didn't really talk about in much detail here or any depth, but I think we're going to IT teams, right? The code for all this stuff, it's complete spaghetti. You know, so it's typically tied into different applications on a per application basis. So almost think of like pulling out a middleware, right, with applications on one side and authenticators or methods on the other side. So, mm. you know, those types of opportunities, I think, exist, you know, more on the enterprise side as well. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Hey, well, look, well, thank you all for a fantastic discussion. Um, it's really an honor to be able to help facilitate it. And I'm, I'm happy to uh, turn things back over to Nathan now to, to uh, wrap things up. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thank you from VLab for all of uh, this amazing discussion and to Andrew um, for your great job moderating. Um, and thank you to the event team and especially to Wen Pai Lu for putting together such a wonderful event. It's a great discussion. For those uh, who wish to join, um, please don't drop off just yet. We are going to move to a new Zoom meeting. Um, and that's because this webinar model from Zoom does not support interactivity. We'd like to give you the chance to interact with some of our wonderful panelists, as well as the VLAB uh, team and event team. So uh, what we will do in a minute is share that URL so that you can easily open. Um, But before we do that, uh, thank you again to our sponsors and supporters. And if you want, please get involved. These events happen because someone is excited about going deep into one of these topics and meeting the exciting companies in the space. And they often show up at one of our planning meetings and start a new event team. Um, We have some going on right now around uh, ag tech and a few others uh, beyond that, that we hope to share more with the community shortly, but those are in the works. And a couple of months later, voila, an event comes together and you get to be a part of it. So do come. Our planning meetings are usually the first Tuesday of the month and the next one is March 2nd. Um, And of course you can uh, always also donate, um, and that is tax deductible. vlab.org slash donate will redirect you to the PayB donation portal. Um, so next up, I will share our link for the after event networking session. So you just go vlab.org forward slash networking into your browser, and we will send it as a chat message right now to all of you as well. Um, and you can click on it, and it will hopefully properly open up a new Zoom meeting, which you could also manually type in using the meeting ID and passcode shown below. And one more way to get it, just in case, because transferring to a whole new Zoom is tricky for people. Um, It is also in your Eventbrite email. So this uh, post-event link and meeting information is also located there. So we cannot start that until we close this session. So we will momentarily close this down. And I want to again say thank you to everyone and hopefully see you in a moment. So give that link a click, get it going, and we'll see you there. All right. Thank you, everyone.